Chief of Warriors. So this is going to be eventually translated into a documentary. I may even do some of the video myself. Not 100%, but let's, uh, let's go on a story ride. So, and there... Mid 2000s, you know, I was tr progressing through this process of a uh, transformation and, you know, worked all these fast food jobs, you know, your Dunkin' Donuts and your Pizza Hut and your. Chipotle and just every terrible fast food job you possibly could have. And, uh, I don't think anybody can ever be successful at it, so I guess there's that. But, you know, I was working these jobs and it was really going nowhere. And you know, my dad was a cop for 20 something years. And so I, uh, I eventually got my Cleveland private police training which uh, in other parts of the country is a constable and uh you know get the training and you know we're going through you know our force on force and handcuffing and glock training and m4 and whatnot and you've got all these military friends you know they're doing this sort of stuff too and you know they're all uh they all had come back from GWAT. They never really talked about it. The initial guys who did the 2000 and 2003, 4, 5, and 6 time period. And that was rough. You know, nobody talked about that time period because it was absolute bullshit. And uh, so getting this training and I ended up working downtown in Cleveland. And if you look on some of the Bone Thugs and Harmony music videos... Euclid and East 19th, something like that, maybe. Um, that was where I worked. And uh, those streets have racked up bodies. Uh, thousands and thousands of people have died on those streets. And that was what I patrolled. Uh, I'm working for a housing authority. And, um, you know, what I, looking back now, some of the most dangerous work that we would do. So, me and a partner. Um, I'll call him, uh, I'll call him Thor for lack of, uh, other nicknames. Giant dude, African-American guy, six foot eight, 350. You know, if there's going to be problems, I'm not fighting you. You're going through Thor because <laughs> he's, uh, <laughs> he's the big guy in this situation. And if he's got to bring out a gun, there's a problem because he's already beating you into the ground. So there's that. And, uh, so now I've got my, uh, they didn't give us a vehicle. So our, our, uh, our patrol vehicle, um, for the housing authority, since we couldn't get one from the, the police, um, department for the district wouldn't give us a vehicle. So we're using a, uh, broken down Crown Victoria, you know, it's worth just absolutely nothing. It barely runs, you know, so we're, we're in this thing, you know, and it's got the, got the divider and all that, you know, so he's just scrunched up in that. So we gave up, we're like, you know what, screw it. This isn't even worth it. We'll just use my car. So we're driving around in this, uh, Subaru, you know, going to all the different, uh, housing authority properties and whatnot and you know we've got a at night we have to clear these buildings so there'll be hood rats doing their normal thing drug dealing and whatnot and so we've got to clear out the laundry facilities and the entrances and whatnot and do it by gunpoint because it's pretty you know, pretty dangerous so every single day we're clearing these buildings <laughs> day in day out and that was our job um <laughs> Yeah, like in a, like a war zone or something like that. Um, and we were, uh, you know, we were doing that for a while. And uh, 
you know, thankfully I never gotten any heated, uh, heated, um, issues in that, that, uh, that position. And I went off to work at another housing authority, um, in Akron. And, you know, what I didn't realize is in this, this housing authority, there had literally been thousands and thousands of deaths there too in Akron. And, uh, so here I am, you know, patrolling these places and every week there's a new, new event and people fighting each other and killing each other and you know doing god knows what and uh so you know the event that sticks out of my mind the big one was there's a there was a fight that broke out between um two people and i we really didn't know why and we go up to the car and uh, the guy's yelling at this girl but you don't know why and she's blue and so I go to give her CPR, you know, get her out of the car, start doing CPR, just keep going and keep going and keep going. And uh, finally the EMT showed up and, um, you know, they put her in the back of the, the ambulance. And uh, then I look behind me and the, finally the, you know, other officers showed up and the, the, uh, the guy who had given this girl, the heroin and why she was, you know, essentially dead, um, was fighting the two officers, whatever. And, um, then a pack of people just came up around us and like, Oh, he didn't do nothing. He didn't do nothing wrong. He's a good boy. He's going to go to college. He's getting his life right. Well, he's fighting the cops and just pummeling them. This guy's six, five, 280 just pummeling these guys and they're trying to tase them and it's not working and uh, finally they're able to pile on the guy and subdue him whatever but you know these cops are like you know 150 pounds 100 pounds they're no match for some guy that's just this big and just destroying them with hits and uh you know, we, we're getting surrounded by like 30 people or whatnot, and, and the whole situation is just getting completely out of control, turning into a riot. They're throwing stuff at us, and we're trying to cordon off the area while they're trying to subdue this guy or whatnot, and it just turns into a complete cluster. And uh, so finally things calm down, and so like 20 or 30 officers all show up and try to take over, and we just get out of there. We're like, nope, we're good. Like other guys have showed up, you know, we're not handling this. Uh, this is not our, not our job, um, to do crowd control and that sort of stuff when you got, you know, a bunch of other people. And, uh, since we have to write the reports for why, <laughs> why we showed up and, and this guy, uh, attempted to murder some girl with, uh, with heroin. And, uh, so weeks go by and I find, Hey, the girl survived. I saw her for a couple of minutes and thankfully I was able to do CPR and um, EMT showed up. And so that was a pretty you know, dramatic effect and kind of fast forward to uh, a couple of years later and I end up at another housing project and I get my special conservator of the piece like a, a constable and uh here i am patrolling the patrolling the ghetto again and uh another uh another riot breaks out on my first day that i'm there we've got 60 people part of the housing authority trying to stop our fellow officer from arresting this girl and she's all beaten up on my partner or whatever she's like 250 five foot just jacking this guy up you know and <laughs> we really don't know what to do because it's like okay she's she's pretty big and we're trying to get her get her cuffed but the the, the cuffs won't connect you know she's just too big to finally get two cuffs clink them together and put them on or whatever get her get her a uh, handcuffed and whatnot, but it just turned into a complete disaster. And <laughs> but too, it's like, it's a girl, right? So, you know, we, we were trying to do the right thing or whatnot, other than, you know, if you're getting beat up, you know, you, you probably shouldn't hit somebody, but you know, 
in that situation, you might want to just deck them and just put them on the ground. But <laughs> she, he was no match, you know, 100, 110 pounds, you know, just 110 pounds soaking, but with all his gear, he's only maybe 100 pounds, and uh, <laughs> just getting pummeled by this girl. And, uh, you know, here I am coming up on the situation and um, don't really know what's my first day there. I don't even know why the situation kicked off. It was just we were we were there and we were patrolling or whatever, and it just kind of kind of happened that way and uh finally get you know everything calmed down and whatnot and in the back of my head i'm like okay i've gotta i've gotta get out of this situation somehow and you know this is later 2000s or whatnot and uh finally i got i was applying for different stuff i don't even really know how i how i uh found out about it but i got a call and they're like hey do you want to you want to go to iraq for 60 grand a year Oh yeah, I'm young and stupid. I'll go to Iraq for sixty grand a year to teach the Iraqi police. Oh yeah, anybody can do it. I can do it, right? I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> Show up to Iraq. <We're laughs> Show up in Baghdad, and we're literally getting blown up the entire time we're there. Every day, incoming shootouts incoming shootouts just like this is a daily occurrence and uh here i'm a you know i'm a police advisor i'm not even i'm not even there to be a uh, a combatant well much to my newfound knowledge that day oh well you're there as a combatant and uh the uh even though you're there to train some the iraqi police um well your job is to be a shooter and so you got to do do your thing but it was that day too that i had uh we were driving back from doing uh uh analysis work for the uh for the police advising programs and whatnot and uh working with the uh, military guys who were handing off the the mission because there was like a military police unit or whatever that was training them and they were turning it over to police advisors and whatnot and uh, this actually goes back to mpri and uh the bosnian war and uh mpri had sent police advisors to bosnia and kosovo so this goes way back i probably assume mpri was actually in phoenix program and stuff like that in vietnam and they were probably training their police i have to look it up but i, I bet that it goes back back to them too it's a long long history of people who are doing that stuff and uh i was driving back and motor had hit kind of further out behind me and whatnot so I'm like, okay have to drive and get to a get to a bomb shelter and finally came upon one and it blew up right exactly behind me and flew me into a concrete barrier and uh i go in the I'm walking towards it, and it just flies me in there, hit the right side of my head, and then hit the uh, hit the left part of my head on the ground. And um, I guess I wake up about an hour later, and some uh, Italian or French soldier brought me into their aid station, and they're doing stitches on me, and then I... Uh, you know, after I'm cognizant, they sent me over to the the U.S. Army medical uh, shack that they had. Like, treat my ear and stuff like that and whatnot. And, um... But oddly enough, they gave me, like, a bunch of drugs that just sent me back to work. So here I am, you know, doing the... Doing the odds and ends and office stuff or whatever, and trying to handle radios and I could barely handle it because it's just piercing through my ears my ears entirely blown out and the drugs are barely working and I'm barely alive just just kind of making do and uh you know I didn't realize you know what really had happened and you know I go back home and I'm just not feeling Feeling as high speed as I should. I'm applying for all these different jobs, and things are closing up in Iraq. And there's this huge move to push everybody to Afghanistan. So we're trying to push 
the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people from you know Iraq to Afghanistan and this big huge push while they're shutting down all the major operations that we were doing in Iraq and um so applying for all these jobs and stuff and I and I really know how how fucked up I really am and uh so I end up going back and trying to find positions and you know, I find a job in a, a Afghanistan and helping out with uh with the logistics you know all the police stuff kind of dried up whatever and so i get there and i'm doing uh helping out with logistics work for the bomb disposal guys and it was really cool they got a really cool mission and whatnot and we're out um in the south of afghanistan and more of the say the desertous kind of areas and whatnot where it's really shitty and more like arizona and uh super dry and just crap <laughs> and uh end up going out there and um it's actually pretty peaceful nothing really kicked off there we had a lot of good standoff which is good so that base probably had like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of standoff and then um you know various uh little combat outposts to keep the main base safe and that sort of thing which is really good because uh, what i didn't know is when i went off to <laughs> another base things would get even worse we were getting freaking hit every single freaking day and uh having to having to do all that stuff which is uh <laughs> just crazy and uh as the years went by i ended up getting uh another contract and i was working on some equipment and my uh just cut my hand on some of the the equipment that I was working on severed the tendons of my hand and I uh here I am you know a, a contractor I'm a military person at all and they're not really set up for this and so I end up uh getting flown out to Kandahar and end up at this giant giant medical facility it's as, you know, as big as any other medical facility that you've ever seen and it's essentially bomb proof my understanding is they they made it to where you know even if there was a bomb that hits it it can't do anything whatever um it can pull, it's just giant concrete sand colored just huge block of a building it, it's ginormous and as I go in there and, um, you know, I've got my, my boss with me and, and the doc said, oh yeah, well, you know, we've stapled together the tendons, right? I didn't know what that meant. They had me on a ton of drugs. I'm not sure what they gave me and I was on a ton of it. Whatever it was, it was good because I didn't feel a thing. And uh, they, they were like, yeah, stay here. We have to find somebody. And uh, thankfully my, uh, my boss, um, who I'll call Brenda, the Irish, the Irish honey. Um, she, uh, she stayed there with me and then said, Hey, sit here. Don't do anything. I'm going to get you home. And, uh, so she was able to talk to some people and like, yeah, we got to get you done with surgery because you know, you'll lose your arm if you don't, you know, do surgery. Because you've severed the tendons in your hand. And you don't do that. You'll lose one function. You start losing others. You start losing others. You can't just cut tendons and then leave them loose, basically. So, uh, I'm there for five seconds. <laughs> they give me some injection. I don't even know what it was. Um, I'm freaking out. Boom, out. I, I do remember them putting me on the table. But I was, like conscious but unconscious then putting me on the table and then just nothing right and uh so then i uh i wake up and then my uh w when i woke up they had put me in like a cast and like i go to move my arm and it like slams me right in the face <laughs> like 20 pounds blaster <laughs> like hits my nose <laughs> It's like, oh crap i can't you know they gave me uh, a medication that you know uh 
probably a ner- uh, a, a nerve block, a propofol, or some sort of alcohol right to the uh, right to the shoulder or into the arm. So you, you can't you don't feel anything at all, and you can't you have no control over it. Um, whatever the nerve block medication is, and uh, slams me right in the face, and it takes uh, takes about a day to to wear off, whatever. And I uh, I wake up and. Uh, You know, wake up again and finally feeling something or whatnot, and then, um, you know, things were things were on the up and up. And so about, I think uh, I think I was there for probably probably five days to a week or something like that. And um, I get all set up to. to get ready to leave and I realize that they're flying me to do I think I fly to Dubai or something like that with a uh, with the EMT or something and then my connecting flight is to freaking Russia so here I am I can barely use my arm or whatever and I've just had surgery and I'm all fucked up. And I, I'm like in Russia, <laughs> in the freaking airport, like on the Russian airlines. So <laughs> when I go to land, the Russians are clapping that we were landing. Like, okay. <laughs> How often do your planes go down and that we're clapping that it's landing, okay? Like, Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> like, I'm freaked the fuck out, right? So then, you know, here here I am going through the the, the Boris Paul freaking airport in Moscow, wherever the hell we're at. And uh, going through the freaking airport. Wherever the hell Boris Paul is, I have to look it up. And uh, going through the airport, I'm all jacked up, high on all these drugs. Finally make it to my other flight, get the heck out of there. End up in D.C., and uh after i think it's like a 10 hour flight or something like that end up in dc thank the lord and uh go straight to the hand surgeon and uh he's like yeah i know you don't want to hear this but i have to do another surgery on you I'm like what are you talking about he's like yeah i gotta make sure the actual tendons are connected and that we're doing the right thing uh, okay, fine. Let's do it. And uh, so, set me up for the surgery and everything. You know, here I am thinking, oh yeah, they did the thing. Everything's gonna be great. Well, no, you have to go through physical therapy. Uh, okay, fine. So, I think I did physical therapy for like had to have been three months or or more, having to regain the use of my arm. I didn't know. You know, nobody had told me, like, hey, yeah, you know, you fuck up your hand, you're going to have to do physical therapy. And, um, well, you previously could lift about 100 pounds. Now you can lift 20 <laughs> or less. Go oh, shit. Okay. Now my whole arm is atrophying and stuff like that from not using it. And then it led to a frozen shoulder. And, um, going through all this process, I'm, I'm learning, okay, well, I've got all these problems that are going on and my, uh, my hormones are kind of crappy. I don't really know, really know how to talk about it. So I'm just talking about the pain that I've got going on. And then I, uh, end up finding out, well, crap, I got to get shoulder surgery because now the shoulder is impinged. And then go through all the surgery for that and didn't do physical therapy for that. That just kind of went on its own. I just kind of did its thing. And then I, uh, end up finding out that, well, no, not only do I got that, I got C4, C5 disc herniations in my spine. So that's what led to the shoulder impingement along with the, the messed up part of just having the fucked up hand. So it'll kind of collapsed into one big problem and that all this pain is coming from that finally get the treatment that I need and 
didn't really solve most of the problems that I was having. What I realized is that I've got something going on that the pain is not necessarily associated with what else is happening. So I end up finding this, uh, this podcast with Dr. Mark Gordon and Andrew Marr. And they're talking about how hormones had helped them and how they were getting treatment and stuff like that. And that, uh, all these deployments are you know, related to TBI and, and that it's a brain problem or whatnot. And so you can have, you know, pain associated with, with, um, you know, lack of energy and brain fog and just these different issues. So I end up getting uh, hooked up with this doc in in DC, and so okay, here we'll give you this like I think it was like ten thousand milligrams of of vitamin D, which oh god, that was just terrible. Um, uh, Literally, like so, no, actually fifty. Th it was actually fifty thousand. So, like, so found out my vitamin D was all fucked up. Found out my testosterone was like two hundred, like twenty something in my twenties, like late twenties. Like, this is not a thing. Like, you should not be that low. And uh, put me on Clomid, and uh, I think there was a Remedex in there too. And uh, didn't evaluate my thyroid at all. Didn't do growth hormone simulation tests or anything like that. And, um, so I was doing a bunch of research. I'm like, okay, this is not right. Like, I don't know what's wrong with this, but this just isn't connecting. So I ended up finding this, like, family, he's like a family medicine, uh, fellowship, and then it, he's an OBGYN by practice. It's like, okay, you know, this guy's interesting. He's got some, like, the functional medicine kind of stuff and whatnot. And, you know, we get along. He's a good guy or whatever. And, he keeps me on Clomid, whatever. And um, going through that, it's like about a, about a year maybe. Things are just getting progressively worse. And then I get these floaters in my eyes. And they're just problems with eye degeneration. And, and uh, shit's just not going well. And I'm getting more like more weird symptoms that I'm just not familiar with. I don't really know how to explain it. And, um, you know, realizing now it's also too, I'm on the, on this cortisol medication. And it's not dosed correctly. And, uh, so it's just all this stuff is just feeling really strange and awkward. And, um, so I'm doing as much research as I possibly can finding out, well, crap, okay. This Clomid is not actually testosterone, even if it, would technically work it's not going to raise your free testosterone so really doesn't matter you can you could be on like a gram of clomid it's not going to do anything um, it's just not how it works and this guy has me on a remedex so all of my estrogens being crashed at the same time where i've got traumatic brain injury and i need aromatase i need the estradiol to then have um any sort of homeostasis and uh brain protective functions that happen from estradiol and uh so it's pretty much broke you know i was wasn't able to really work and you know i'm working these highfalutin consulting jobs in dc and just high stress stuff and dealing with government employees or absolute shit birds and uh get this one job or this really like high high level finance job and um I find out that the reason why this job has been open for so long is this government employee just beats up on every person that she works for, screaming at the top of her lungs, bloody murder at you know, at all of her employees. And, um, you know, the first day I'm there, I'm like, oh, shit, okay, I got to get out of here. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to work with my bosses and stuff like that. And, you know, things are progressively getting worse. Some degeneration's happening. Uh, you know, I'm losing the ability to walk correctly and that sort of thing. And, and 
don't really know why, but you know, there's there's major problems. And uh, my hormones are also a problem too. So I'm on this, you know, these cortisol medications. But you know, if you're in a high stress and a, well, an extreme stressful situation, in this case, um, you're not going to go anywhere. So you know, I report it to the senior executive service guy, literally appointed by the president, kind of person. And uh, that's not a turn of phrase. The senior executive person is a representative of the president. So they're literally a direct representative, and. Um, they're appointed and um so i report it and i'm like you know what nope i'm out of here I'm quitting this day i am done and uh quit and uh while i'm there i'm packing up all my stuff she's screaming at the top of her lungs i'm like no i'm getting out of here pack up all my stuff got out and uh then went off to the office uh, for the company, and they're all like, oh, well, why did you leave? That sort of thing. Like, dude, she's literally screaming at the top of her lungs. And then they get a call from her, screaming through the phone or whatever. I'm like, and you see why I left? You know, like, this is the situation I'm in. And, uh, you know, I get home, and my I probably was in an adrenal crisis now, and I know what's up. And I'm just completely done. There's just no... And two, I don't have any testosterone either, so I don't I don't know why I'm feeling as shitty as I am, but you know nothing was going right, and so I uh, I don't have a lot of money. So I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do? So I find this bodybuilding clinic, and uh, one of the top ones, you would know who they are if I mentioned them, which I'm not. Um, they're good. So I don't want to you know make light of their name. They do really good work. But I go to them, you know, I have my consultation. It's like literally 25 minutes. So, you know, this you know, they give me 200 milligrams of testosterone. There's a Remedex in there, which thankfully I don't take. I'm smart enough to know I'm not going to take it. And uh, that's all they gave me. So there was no, uh, no evaluation of my thyroid, no growth hormone, no real vitamin D looking at anything like that or um, and also too since knowing that I'm on cortisol no evaluation of the cortisol as well so nobody had evaluated any of that and so you know I'm on this for like six months forever and um, it's just not going right something's just wrong um, I find out okay well dosing's a problem so um, for me personally I'm obese and I've got you know other metabolic stuff going on and so I find out okay Doing this once or twice a week ain't working for me personally, so I go to three times a week. Still getting these strange crashes, like just huge ups and downs. I'm aromatizing the medication like super quick. And um, go to daily. Okay, good. I don't have the crashes, but then I don't have the energy that I need either. So I go and change the 3ML from 3ML um, syringes to 1ML. Well, I screw up. <laughs> I think that uh, <laughs> zero. I think that uh, what was the dose at the time? So if it was two hundred, two, maybe two twenty. I I, can't, I forget. So it was I forget. I think it was at two twenty, two twenty milligrams at the time. But I went from instead of doing zero point one point. 0.1.5 I thought that that meant 2 m uh, is it 2 mls 0.2 yeah it would be 0.2 so I thought that because that would be like 20 milligrams from like that so I went to, to 0.2 which turns out to be like 200 and something milligrams <laughs> and uh, end up going to to 200 and uh 290 milligrams of medication per uh, per week by accident. I'm like, oh crap! Okay, this actually feels you know decent. I don't have any crashes. Really stabilized. This feels pretty good. Do follow up blood work. My free testosterone is between like 48 and like 50 something, depending on you know when you test it. It's like, oh, you know, this is actually where I feel pretty good. I'm you know really really stabilized kind of at this dose and it just was an accident and it just happened and so then i find out okay well i'm still getting this like weird energy problems and i'm not able to really gain lose any weight i still have muscle loss you know i'm finding out too with my spine that i have since i have spinal degeneration and i've got c4 c5 disc herniations that 
Growth hormone is related to spine problems, degeneration, along with traumatic brain injuries. I'm like, well, fuck, what do, I, what do I do to solve this? No one's testing this. My IGF-1 supposedly says it's correct. So I find this this uh, this podcast um, episode on YouTube, and um, Dr. Tamara Wexler. He's a highfalutin New York I think she went to Harvard. I'm just going to say she went to Harvard. Pretty sure she did. Highfalutin New York doctor, you know, talking about how traumatic brain injury and growth hormone is a thing. We treat it the same way as we treat testosterone and thyroid. And that she mentioned that IGF-1 was not a marker for traumatic brain injury and growth hormone because IGF-1 is a mimic. It's something that you can use, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have release of the hormone. You can still have IGF-1 that is higher, but then your actual growth hormone secretions are actually lower. And especially if it's impaired from traumatic brain injury and uh, pituitary dysfunction. So... Find out this is the case. Get hooked up with her. Didn't realize, okay, well, this is not like a regular concierge doc. This is a highfalutin concierge doc. Bill comes in 800 bucks or something like that. Holy crap. <laughs> Here I am, broke. <laughs> Don't got any real money. You know, um, I'm still fighting the government since Defense Base Act um, through the um, contractor process. When you get hurt, it's like McDonald's work comp. So, you know, I'm having to fight the insurance companies um, to get health care since I don't have Veterans Affairs benefits. Since I'm not technically a veteran, even though I was disabled in war. Lafayette gets his house. He's a contractor. He's a, a prince of freaking France. But here I am can't get jack shit and uh so i get this bill like oh crap what am i gonna do for this and then uh i just okay well you have to get this growth hormone simulation test i don't know anything about this don't know what it's what it is i'm trying to read up on it it's all this technical jargon there nobody's done like an actual paper that says this is what a glucagon simulation test is. This is how it works. This is what happens. I need to write this myself because no one's done it. And um, so I I go down there, get a hotel. I didn't even look up the hotel. I'm, I'm down in Richmond, Virginia. You have the closest hotel that I can to the place. I'm in the hood, in the ghetto again. <laughs> Just bringing back memories of my time, you know, doing <laughs> police stuff. And uh, find out that... Here I am in the hood, or whatever, and uh, got a plan to get down to where I need to be. And there's just like hoodlums out everywhere doing their doing their drug deals, whatever nonsense that they're up to. And uh, so drive drive over to the the hospital and get in there. And they're like, okay, well, yeah, we're gonna get you this glucagon simulation test, and uh, everything will be great. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. So. Give me the injection. Immediately, you're in hypoglycemia. I'm like, oh crap! That's what they mean about hypoglycemia. <laughs> so, it's like you're high, but then not in a good way. And then you're like, your brain's all fogged up, and like you really, you're like you can connect things, but it's just not right, and it just it just feels strange. And then um, you kind of want to puke, but then you don't really have that like other part of it so you're just like nauseous without the puking part like, it's just strange and so you're doing this and they're taking blood every hour and then um you know I, i'm there for three hours and then they're, they're gonna do the other one like oh no well the the lab couldn't process something whatever so we may have to keep you here for more hours and they call up and like oh no it'll be fine everything will be great and um so i uh finally getting the last one done and then you know, I wasn't planning on driving home end up in the car and I'm like I'm still fucked up and I'm like well no one's told me anything about not having food so I'm like you know I'm just gonna take some food take some more meds and get on the road and do my drive it's 
almost five hours or something like that. It's just fucking dragging the entire time. Finally, the medication wears off when I'm finally home. Wears off, and then I wait almost two weeks to get the results back of the Sukugan simulation test. Find out it's completely flat. Don't have any growth hormone in my entire body. <laughs> this is this is nuts. And uh, so my doc puts in this prescription. Month goes by, still isn't going through. Talking to the insurance company, whatever, and they're I'm dealing with some nonsense people and overseas, and where our languages just are not mixing, and just constant issues with it, and then. Three months goes by, and then still there's issues, and I end up getting a uh, a service dog donated to me by uh, Operation 22 from a friend, and uh service dog is named Dina. She's a German short hair pointer. Got cool, cool white spots basically. And the um, first day that I'm with her, she's on the lead out back of my house. It's a metal line, and then there's a a rope you know, that she's connected to. Sitting there the first day that I'm with her on the ledge. You know, I'm six feet up in the air. She comes across, the line hits across my, my chest, flips me right over on the back of my head. <laughs> so, here's my third traumatic brain injury now. <laughs> and, uh... You know, it's really precarious about going to the ER because you know, I knew what was going to end up happening which will foreshadow this next part of the story and uh, go look in the mirror my eyesight is looking right it's fine I don't have any weird movements whatever got this brain fog I feel like crap but you know, I, I know what's going on. I'm like, well, I'm just going to wait until Monday so I can get x-rays done and then maybe get a uh, CT scan or whatever. So go over to the, the doc that I've been working with for bone stuff, my osteo doc, and uh, go to try to get x-rays. Guy's out. Not even working. Nobody's there. I'm like, okay. And they're like, okay, well, you can go over to the, you know, acute care kind of place minute clinic basically for their shop and uh, see the doc there so go there get x-rays they don't see anything but they're like no you had a head thing you need to get a ct scan you have to go to the er fine i'll go go there sitting there for like an hour you know that here i am all zonked out you know, I obviously don't have any growth in my body. Feeling like crap. And, uh... Put me in the CT scan. And as soon as I do that, you know, they don't help me down or whatever. And it torques my spine. Now I know. After the CT scan's going through, I'm all zonked out and feeling all crappy. Well, now I've got... C3 through C6 herniations when I originally had C4, C5. That's why I'm in this crap, much pain as I'm in. And, uh, call the doc, you know, I need to, I need growth hormone, I need progesterone, I need you to put me on a ketamine IV. Didn't do none of it. He's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a crap load of pain and like barely conscious um, from when they traction my spine. And having new herniations, find out, well, this guy's trying to give me, like, benzodiazepines, freaking Toradol, um, and probably, like, an SSRI or some other crap like that. 
And, you know, I'm reading through when I get to the pharmacy, like, what this guy's trying to give me? I'm like, absolutely the fuck not. Like, half the stuff's contraindicated for, you know, what, what you do for traumatic brain injury. Like, none of this, none of this makes any sense. Like, this is not what you're supposed to do. And, um... So, day goes by, and things are just getting progressively worse. And I end up back at the ER again, go in there... And, you know, I tell him, hey, you need a ketamine IV, I need progesterone, need you to get me growth hormone. Wouldn't listen to me, trying to give me Toradol, trying to give me a bunch of other stuff that's contraindicated for TBI. Can't even remember what they are. Wouldn't even click in my brain. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to take more pain meds and I'm going to do this outpatient because you're obviously not treating me well and you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So I end up uh, making a bunch of phone calls after I get out of there and drag myself home, find some ketamine infusion places and um, roughly, hell, I was thinking it was five days after, maybe even longer, finally get into a ketamine infusion place. And, um, so, you know, I've read up on ketamine infusion therapy and, you know, I know it scientifically it works through the NMDA receptor, which is how your body processes pain. Basically gives you an analgesic, analgesic effect, lowers the glutamate in the brain, and then essentially allows you to feel good and in our main part of traumatic brain injury treatment is to lower the glutamate so that it lowers the inflammation in the brain and the body and then provides you safety so then you can continue on with uh with the rest of the treatment that you have to be on well i knew it scientifically but i didn't understand it um in the realities of what happens when you're on pain management so i'm on pain drugs and then uh what happens when you uh you take the the, the nmda medication while you're on it so hook me up do the iv guys a guy's the best you can give me an IV any day he wants. He slipped it right in, boom, he's he's running ready to go. He's like, hey, as soon as I flush this, you're gonna pass out. I'm like, oh yeah, whatever, yeah, maybe. <laughs> One second, boom, I'm out. <laughs> and uh he's talking to me, you know, a little bit. You know, things are moving and moving and moving, and we kinda wake up a little bit, and then boom, I'm just fucking out. And uh then I go through the uh, go through the process, and you know you don't, you don't even realize you're there. Um, but the main part that was really tough was when you know I started waking up and like you're not conscious, and it was really like a painful feeling of of uh, trying to wake up and get out of it, which I really did not like at all. That was part of the because I you were there, you were like conscious, then you're not. It was just like an immediate thing. And I, I didn't really go through anything. It was but it was the process of waking up that was really bad that I really didn't didn't like. And uh then I was getting really, really nauseous. I'm waking up and I'm kinda of talking to my uncle um, about different things and waking up, waking up, and then it was just like a super nauseous, you know, feeling that came over me. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't really feel too bad. And then they got me in the car and then got me outside to the, the vehicle. and started just puked as soon as I walked out. <laughs> and then uh, I'm sitting in the car, whatever, getting ready to head out. And then I puke more. I'm like, oh, crap, this sucks. And, uh... I'm not, even, I'm not sure if we stopped on the side of the road. I don't think we did. I think we went like maybe a block or two. We went to go get some gas, and I'm puking in the parking lot or whatever. I'm like, oh, crap, this sucks. And so they end up calling my uh, my uncle, and they're like, oh, hey, you know, we forgot to give you more anti-nausea meds. Oh, you would think, you know. So they just kind of screwed up on the anti-nausea stuff, which <laughs> if you know when you do this as a job, um, you... Uh, you give patients a ton of anti-nausea medication while you're in the hospital, but in an outpatient, you know, kind of thing, they don't really do that. Um, 
they kind of let you go and you're supposed to take it with you or you're supposed to have other anti nausea stuff with you but um they don't have that kind of time since you're just doing it in an outpatient sort of thing and uh, so i'm just puking up you know puke my guts out whatever and then uh you know for the first five hours whatever just feeling kind of feeling kind of you know jacked up whatever you don't really have any um uh, lots of control over your body, so you're like basically drunk, you know, really, really drunk, actually, and you can't really control a lot of things, whatever, and uh, so I'm just laying down, whatever, and just, you know, the pain's kind of getting up there, and getting up there, and I'm like, okay, what's going on with this? I'm like, oh, it clicks. Yeah, this drug is occupying my NMDA receptor, and now I'm in a crap load of pain. I'm like, oh, no. Okay, well, that makes a little bit more sense. So then, day two goes by, finally you know i've i'm out of all the pain that i was in which is great but then i still have this groggy kind of feeling whatever and uh just felt just kind of jacked up whatever and uh but it was like the fourth or fifth day it was like oh crap you know i can walk around and move around i'm not in a bunch of pain i uh the analgesic effect was still there, and there was still this decrease of inflammation, and it was the first time that I had felt pain-free. I was like, oh, wow. So for patients that, you know, are not on pain management, and they actually have a, they take, you know, ketamine or whatever, and they have the, the therapy, you know, you're going to have this immediate pain relief effect, and uh, you're going to feel great because you just won't have that pain uh, since you have the NMDA receptor occupation and uh, you're just not going to feel that way. It's like, oh man, I'd love to feel like this all the time. This would be great, but I'm on pain management because I've got spinal damage and <laughs> now I've got hip damage uh, from getting blown up. And uh, yeah, so that was the ketamine side of things. I ended up going home and Still don't have the growth hormone or whatever, even after <laughs> the two months, uh, two months after my third traumatic brain injury. And uh, note to medical institutions: if anything like this happens, make sure you check up on the people who are doing your medical authorizations when you have acute patients. Make sure that they have their growth hormone prescriptions, things done correctly. Turns out, I find out. The third month later that my uh, growth hormone uh, prescription authorization, someone had clicked the button that I was taking uh, medications that I wasn't taking. The Arumidex pops up again. Um, not taking that. And uh, found out that was what was going on. And uh, so I ended up getting with my family medicine doc, who's uh, a veteran and uh, works at a regular regular hospital. He sent me some progesterone and uh so after after doing the ketamine infusion i end up taking uh progesterone for roughly three weeks and i may actually continue it um depending on um the different um results of it but um, it's another medication that drops glutamate so the whole point of this treatment is and ketamine and progesterone is for acute traumatic brain injury to get that glutamate as low as you can so then you stop the cytokine and chemokine process so you stop the inflammation to the target tissues and you stop it from damaging your body and stop stopping it from uh sending those uh, signals to then destroy your tissues so but on the the progesterone and um today i uh, thankfully fedex sent in my growth hormone now that the authorization was done correctly and uh <laughs> get the medication in or whatever and open up the pen thing I'm like oh this is t actually terrible so you know you have to set up this the system, whatever, you know, the way that you do it through the pen, you know, it's like an insulin pen, and, uh, you know, I get this, and it's this fancy pen thing, whatever, and it's got the, got the vial on top of it, and you, uh, you know, you put your needle on, and then you have to, to prime it, and I, I didn't understand what somebody was talking about when they said that they had a, um, when they set it up originally, they didn't prime it correctly, and then when they didn't do that, they, I, and now that I know, you actually have to turn it a multiple slots past dosing to then get to the prime button. And they didn't do that. They clicked on probably 
whatever the max dose is, so 10 IUs, whatever, and um, just drop $20,000 worth of medication on the ground. And uh, now it makes a little bit more sense, and I set it up and uh, you know did the prime, whatever, and whatnot. I'm like, telling the pharmacist on the phone, I'm like, you know, I really should actually just get this like with the regular vial and just do this the way that you normally do where you <laughs> take your syringe and you just you know do the thing which i might end up doing because it's like this is this is ridiculous this whole pen thing like you know it's all fancy and whatnot but you lose medication so when you when you prime it and then you have to get it ready it actually sprays out medication like who designed this like this is terrible and you know obviously there's millions of dollars on the line so you know that's that's, that's what's going on but uh so I finally get my growth hormone, which I'm going to start taking tonight. And um, it was absolutely hilarious to me. I'm like, so this whole time, you know, it was terrible. And I'm fighting and fighting and fighting. This doc costs, you know, every follow-up business another 600 bucks, whatever, you know. And she's the top person in the country for this. But, you know, here her own people are messing up the authorizations to do the medication. And, uh, you know, here I'm dealing with it and having to deal with people in the Philippines and India, you know, who are doing the, the customer service for this insurance company. And nobody's able to fix this until finally I'm the one who calls up and asks about the authorization. And, and why it got denied and find out from the insurance company that well it's because they clicked a the button i'm like oh gosh okay so finally get the medication today i'm going to start taking that and uh you know through this process you know you know doing the video that i had done a couple of weeks back and about um cte legacy foundation and wounded warrior we have a major problem in traumatic brain injury and we have these neurology centers for big, the big medical institutions. Then we have TRT clinics and we have psychiatry being pushed as the main fix the problems. And they don't back up any of the work, right? They don't have any blood tests. They just give you drugs and then put you in talk therapy. They can't back up any of their work. And in science, we back up all of our work. All our point is to use the scientific method, which means that we take a basis of claim and then we test the claim through a process. And then we do an experiment and then use our knowledge to then make science right well that's not what they do right um uh, they just <laughs> here's some ssris and lithium let's uh let's put you in talk therapy and talk about your problems and uh, if i would have went down that road you know i'd be in a different place than i am but thankfully i had learned from dr mark gordon and uh applied you know his knowledge but i'm three years behind where i should be and when i when once i knew about that you know i should have been able to do the testing myself but the main issue that i find with this whole process is that from those times of doing cop work and being in a bunch of trauma various car accidents various falls and all of this there's not been one single center that had a nurse prac or a PA who specifically trained to handle this and we're going to run your blood we're going to do do a ketamine infusion we're going to give you some progesterone we're then going to take a look at all your hormones we're going to replace all your hormones and we're going to get you moving in a direction in which you can heal there's not but one center one place won anything that's been able to do this and i've tried to cobble together different doctors be able to cobble together the knowledge that i have but I'm a regular guy i mean i can talk to you about you know force on force and uh the uh the continuum of uh the for the force continuum of oh if you're supposed to take out your baton or if you take out your taser or if you you know blast someone or you put them in a in a uh, a subdued hold and you put the put your uh your knee on their back and you arrest them and handcuffing techniques and <laughs> you know the uh finance knowledge that i've got you know and doing you know contracts whatever you know, all this knowledge has been absolutely worthless. And so I've had to, you know, cobble together all this kind of knowledge into like a grug plumber um, 
Neanderthal <laughs> way of doing things. And uh, it's only from my my sheer tenacity and being an asshole that I've uh, <laughs> been able to come together with all of these uh, these kind of concepts and ideas and put them together. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that it equals to something that's going to be successful and long-term. And uh, I do have to face that may, that, you know, not getting treatment has, uh, has done damage, but it also is, I'm thankful that I know certain topics as well, because having gone to that big Appalachian University Medical Center, and that twice, two doctors not having any knowledge about traumatic brain injury, and me knowing more than them, which is a huge, which is a huge problem, and them not having the ability to even treat me, and then even at the traumatic brain injury nonprofit that they have, they're not connected with the actual it's a neurology group and actually what I found out through this whole process is that every single place that is in the immediate area of Washington DC including the VA and uh, NIH are all neurology centers and none of the docs are trained in hormone replacement therapy or using ketamine as a frontline treatment or using progesterone as a frontline treatment even though NIH is the one who's pushing it there was nowhere to go to get singular focus traumatic brain injury treatment and even at the amen clinics and stuff like that you go in there it's going to be a psychiatry based traumatic brain injury treatment for a disease that has to deal with inflammation and so they might throw you in a hyperbaric chamber but they're not going to be able to run a ketamine iv they're not going to be able to do the hormone replacement part and run that and then be able to then stabilize you they're doing, you know, this magnetic resonance and whatever, whatever stuff the psychiatrists are pushing these days and, and uh, neurologists, which it might help. It's ancillary treatments, but it's not something that is really valuable to what TBI patients have going on, which is acute inflammation. They need to be treated with ketamine and with progesterone and then uh, stabilization treatments in terms of a... Uh, of hormones and all of that completely fell down on its face. You know, I've gone through my story and hopefully this will be turned into like a real kind of documentary or whatnot. I'm going to try to get my own uh, footage or whatnot or try to get some, uh, maybe get someone to make this into something decent. But I hope this story of mine kind of helps you to get the care that you need and where you don't have to go through what I did and uh, be mistreated the entire time and that you have a group of docs who can help you get to where you need to be and uh, that you don't have to suffer um, one thing I didn't add is I'm going to try cerebral license at some point Cerebral lysin is, is uh, synthesized from pig's brain. I think it's technically synthetic. I'm not sure if it still has its pig brain stuff, but basically it's a uh, reparative technology peptide medication that you take. It was created by the Russians, I think, and then transferred to Austria. And so there's a company called Ever Pharma in Austria that makes cerebral lysin, and you can contact the... Uh, technically, an Aust Austrian would be like Apothecary International, so, but it's a, it's the International Pharmacy of Austria. Contact the International uh, Pharmacy of Austria or Ever Pharma directly. They'll get you in contact with a pharmacy that's locally there. And uh, basically, you do this uh, an acute. You would do it through an IV. It's stroke treatment in over 25 European countries as the first line stroke and traumatic brain injury treatment. Um, but you can get this uh, outpatient as well, and you just microlyze the dose, so then you just take it in a in a shorter format. Basically, you take this, and um, it essentially repairs the brain on a restorative level, and I guess you get a lot of good sleep through it. So you, uh, what I heard from uh, Leo on YouTube is that you, uh, you'll need to dedicate some time to get like 10 or 14 hours of sleep. And I guess it like, you know, puts you in a reparative state and, uh, you know, heals your brain or whatnot. That may not, that may just be for him personally. It may not happen to every person like that. Um, but then you would do that to then heal your brain and you, uh, you do those injections. Um, 
secondarily um, something to add as well is doing glutathione as well so you know we need good glutathione levels pretty much everybody's low so you just do it but it cleans out the body so it's the same thing we do for anybody who has an overdose of uh, acetaminophen or other types of medications you give them NAC or glutathione and you would do glutathione injections or do the IVs um, and then on top of that we'd also want to add uh, I just started actually a couple of weeks back um, thymosin alpha one, which is uh, works on the thymus gland, and that's actually what provides you uh, immune system uh, regeneration. And so then you work with thymosin alpha one um, in an IV or in uh, intramuscular injections, and then Myers cocktail or vitamin C IVs. That's something really important to then add. So basically, our whole goal is to just ramp up the immune system to just attack anything that's bad in the body, no matter what it is, and uh, then. It's especially with vitamin C IVs, you know, it's used for cancer, um, but it's used for just regular general immunity or flus and that sort of thing. And you're able to ramp up the immune system and just kill anything that's bad through thymalphosin 1 and uh, thyma al thymosin alpha 1 and with uh, vitamin C and glutathione injections. Very, very important. If there's anything that's bone or... Um, uh, gut as well we want to add body protective compound 157 so bpc 157 and you would then add that um, as well and that basically repairs parts of the body and then um provides other immune system you know issue uh, help as well and then heals the gut which is very important so you know when we have uh, hypothalamus pituitary gonadal access we also have gut to brain barrier access problems as well so our goal through this you know on top of this treatment for traumatic brain injury is to also heal the gut because where there's brain problems there's gut problems now then we know that there's a a general fluid access between it and there's not this oh you have a gut and you have a brain or you have a gut brain access that actually controls different processes so you want to add that you know as well um, and then magnesium L3 and 8, very important. And uh, vitamin D. And I've been pushing the new Medica um, mycelized vitamin D, which means it's water soluble, so you can take more and you don't have any side effects. So, you know, the side effects that I had, you know, taking higher doses, when you're taking 5,000 to 10,000 IUs, um, it's really important that you, you'd go to like a water soluble, so you don't have to deal with uh, the side effect issues that you'd get from higher doses. I think it's through the fat metabolism part. Maybe there's something else that's giving you the side effects, but um, taking it water soluble, I don't have those side effects. So I, I, I get really uh, good positive benefits. And uh, New Medica is one of the bigger brands. I don't know the other ones. I haven't tried them. New Medica is the best for me personally. It's worked. Um, that's uh, been a huge deal. And then pregnenolone. You know, we need good pregnenolone um, levels in our body. It's the up part of the t of the hormone cascade, and uh, it's one of the higher ones um, below cholesterol. And something very very important that we need for traumatic brain injury. Uh, treatment and uh, I had that concurrently going with progesterone so I take proge progesterone at night when I sleep um, when I originally took it you know the first time that I took it I had some uh, some uh, dizziness you know so I that's why docs say to take it at night or whatever when you go to sleep so you don't have that feeling and uh, I had that for the first initial week you know I don't, I don't know when I get a new batch if uh, I only had that for the first couple of days I don't know for the if that's just from getting used to it or if uh, if the potency goes lower if you don't refrigerate it so i might have i might need to have refrigerated the medication they didn't put that on there so i'll find out through that but i'm adding that concurrently so technically progesterone's downstream of pregnenolone so you would want to uh, to take that but we want to take that both so our goal is to lower inflammation and lower um um the you know, the bad stuff in our body and upregulate the good things. And uh, so we're t I'm taking that both, and then I'm still taking 290 of uh, testosterone cypionate. Um, I may even try to push that higher, depending. Um, or I may end up adding uh, nandrolone decanate. So I got all this bone stuff going on, you know. Yeah. You know, you need some way to keep your bones moving. And uh, nandrolone decanate puts synovial fluid in the joints and, and helps your, your bones and stuff like that, um, which is really good. Um, but obviously you can't push the doses. It's just too high because DECA can give you uh, um, some issues with your libido and, um, and uh, just different 
uh, issues or whatnot. So it's better to kind of keep it lower and the, the normal dosing is 100 milligrams to 200 milligrams concurrently with testosterone. So you'd want to kind of, you're going to want to, that's very precarious. You want to work, go low and slow with that with your doc. But, you know, I'm so currently taking that um, for my treatment and uh, very huge as well, adding D-ribose for your ATP production. So my understanding with ATP is that it directly works on the mitochondria and part of our immune system and part of our process for the body and then healing is mitochondrial function. And that's impaired when you have traumatic brain injury. So it's not really talked about as much. I'm not really sure why. I think maybe other docs are probably pushing something else for ATP. I don't remember what it is, but um, D-ribose is cheap. You know, it's, it's, a, it's technically a sugar or a saccharide, but it's not like a real sugar. It's it's a chemical like that but it basically um it actually tastes like sugar which is kind of cool so it actually has kind of a similar taste and uh i think it's technically made from corn actually but um yeah you take d ribose uh two almost two tablespoons so one and a half i think it's like 1600 milligrams um so i just take two tablespoons of that and uh, you take that twice a day and that feeds your mitochondria to give you energy and uh, repair that because when you damage that function through traumatic brain injury you have to regain that or you're just gonna you know, have very bad downstream effects or whatnot um so i've been doing that and uh adding l-citrulline for kind of general nitric oxide um more vascularity sort of stuff uh uh, move things around I, when i originally was getting dialed in on different dosages um your body metabolizes testosterone and wants to to utilize more oxygen and so your blood i'm not sure you you're we are more vascular so you want to be able to to move the blood more more fluidly and that's done through my nitric oxide i don't really have those issues now but i still kind of take it every now and then you know which which has been working out pretty good and uh, has been really successful um you know i think i'm gonna end it here um hopefully this get chopped up instead of my pauses or other stuff will be taken out but um this is my uh traumatic brain injury story and uh i hope everyone else has success in theirs and that you can take what i've done and apply it to what you've got going on and succeed because you don't need to feel like shit you can get better and you can find a way to then get health healthy without having to be on lots of drugs um, that have lots of side effects. You can do that without um, these heavy psych drugs, and you can do it without being a victim. If you want to go through talk therapy, go through talk therapy. But my opinion, it's worse. And uh, as men with TBI... Our goal is to get better, team up, and conquer the world. Maybe for women, you know, who want to go through talk therapy and want to do that, hey, that's what you're you're about. But um, as I see it, we're a warrior culture as Europeans, and uh, our goal is to conquer. Conquer life, conquer the world, and uh, succeed. I... Uh, Hope you guys enjoy this and get better. This is Brad from TRT for Warriors, and please join the Facebook group. TRT for Warriors on Facebook. Tell your friends. Thank you.
man shots. And two little birds out there we're getting shot at. Shot out. 